Hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is Pastor Kevin Cosby sitting in the hot seat. And it is a hot seat because uh, Sister Geneva Nelson is usually uh, in this seat uh, doing an outstanding job providing us with great biblical material and making the word of God come alive. Every time she teaches and I watch her teach, I say, well done, Nelson, because she, she is tremendous. And uh, I am having the opportunity, I guess because it's um, uh, my birthday weekend, uh, to teach the lesson this weekend. It's a lesson that I have prepared and written, uh, and it's one of five lessons that I am, am crafting uh, for our new members. And um, while it's material that if you are a veteran in the faith, uh, it is something that I hope that maybe you'll go back and look at. You know, when it comes to church growth and how we get people into our church, there are three ways that a church grows. And Christ wants the church to grow, not for the church's sake. Let me say that. We don't grow for the church's sake. We grow because we believe and we're convicted that people need Christ. But there are three ways churches grow. They grow uh, biologically. There's biological church growth. For example, <clears throat> my daughter, who is a member of St. Stephen Church, she would be a part of what you would call biological church growth because uh, she grew up in St. Stephen Baptist Church. So that's biological growth. Then there is transfer growth. And that is when people move from one church to another church. And that is legitimate church growth, um, except when you have people who are the consummate church shoppers, who are constantly looking for the new, the new hottest church in town. And, and that's never a motivation. Sometimes uh, your journey changes and you were on a journey at one church and now it's another church um, that, you know, it's, it's the journey for you. And uh, so there is something called transfer growth. But the type of growth that Christ is really looking for is not just biological growth or transfer growth, but it is what is called conversion growth. And that is people who've never known Christ and they join the church. And the series of lessons is to help a person discover what do I do after I join the church? That's called discipleship. You know, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said that to Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, all who were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now think about that. I Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Which suggests that if you're not fishing, you're not following. Now what does it mean to fish for men? What it means to fish for men is that when you fish for fish, you take a fish that is in a living environment, namely water, and you bring it into a dead environment because fish can't survive outside of water. That's fishing for fish. But when you're fishing for men, you're taking people who are in a dead environment because they don't know God, they don't know Christ, and you bring them into a living environment and they get to come alive because Christ brings, gives us life. He says, I have come. He said, the thief cometh, but to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. And, you know, and in that verse, John 10 to 10, you have both the mission statement of the devil and the mission statement of Jesus. Think about it. It says, the thief cometh, that's the devil, but to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I have come, here's his mission statement, that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Where you come alive in Jesus, you become a Christian, but that's not the end. That's just the beginning of the journey. The next phase of the journey is what is called discipleship. And the series of lessons that I am writing is designed to help in the process as, as new persons in Christ, babes in Christ, begin their journey, their pilgrimage in spiritual growth and maturation to the point <clears throat> that they begin to resemble Christ, because that's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, there was a man who was shining his shoe, and he kept on hitting the shoe and brushing the shoe and brushing the shoe, and the shoe started talking and says, why do you keep brushing me? Why are you having all this friction on me? And the man who was brushing the shoe said, I, 
I'm brushing you because I want to be able to see my reflection in you. And sometimes maybe God allows some friction to come in our lives and some friction, some friction. And you say, God, why are you brushing me? Why are you hitting me with this rag? And God says, I'll keep doing it until I can see my reflection in you. Now, today's lesson is a good lesson. And it's something that I hope that you will let God and the Holy Spirit saturate your mind with. Here's the title of the lesson. Only you can be you. Only you can be you. I once heard of a story of a woman <clears throat> who was quite wealthy. In fact, she paid for everything in her home. She's married. And she's wealthy. And she says to her husband, you know, all this stuff in the house wouldn't be here if it were not for my money. And he looked at her and said, honey, I wouldn't be here either if it wasn't for your money. Now, that's a funny little story, but it segues us into an important question. And here is the important question. Why are you here? What is your life purpose? So many of us have no idea why we're here, why God created us. In fact, some of us look to other people and we get our cue from other people instead of giving our cue from God who created us. Let me tell you what. Three of the most important questions in life begin with the letter M. And here they are. Master, mate, mission. Master, who will I serve? And as a Christian, you've already answered that. And the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 10 and 9 says, For whosoever so, so confess the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Believe in the heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you've answered that question. Your Lord, your master is Jesus Christ. And when it comes to mate, who will be my mate? Who will I love? And that is a very critical, important, amen decision. I was a man who was on an airplane and he had his wedding band on the wrong hand. Someone asked him, why do you have your wedding band on the wrong hand? He said, because I married the wrong woman. And some of you may feel that way. I married the wrong man. I married the wrong woman. Well, you know what? If you married the right woman, if you married the right man and you treat them wrong, they might become the wrong man or wrong woman. But if you've married the wrong man and wrong woman and treat them right, you might help them become the right man and you might help them become the right woman. So master, who will I serve? Mate, who will I love? And mission, what will I do? And God has a mission for your life. God has a purpose for your life. Uh, you were not some afterthought. Uh, you were not some uh, explosion of molecules that came together with no purpose. You were created for a purpose. God told the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, God said, now look, Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you and I called you to be a prophet for the nations. This was something God had planned before Jeremiah was born. And Jeremiah found out what that purpose was. And for 40 years, Jeremiah served as one of the great prophets um, of Judah. He served faithfully to God, but he was able to do it because he knew what God wanted him to do. What about you? In fact, the Bible says you, we should do everything we can to find out what the Lord would have us to do. <clears throat> Let me tell you some throwaways. You know, uh, one of the methods that we learned about in preaching and teaching is before you get to the answer, you go with some throwaways. You start off saying, you make a point and say, but you don't do this and you don't do this. So let me, let me use, employ that methodology and share with you some throwaways of what, of what you are not here and what your purpose is not. First of all, you were not created to compete. 
You were not com created to compete with anyone else. And that is a terrible trap that the devil often puts us in. And that's the trap of competing, trying to, you know, up, up one, one up somebody, maybe when it comes to a house or when it comes to creature comforts and, and, and commodities. And that's not why God created us. We were not created, amen, to compete. I find it interesting in the Old Testament that Amos and first Isaiah, um, first Isaiah, because I say first Isaiah because the prophet Isaiah, the chapters 1 through 39 is first Isaiah. And then you have chapters 40 through 66, and that's, and that's second Isaiah. But first Isaiah was a contemporary of Amos and Micah and Hosea. They were all contemporaries. But God didn't call Hosea to be Amos, and Amos, God didn't call Amos to be Hosea, and God didn't call Micah to be Isaiah, and God didn't call Isaiah to be Micah. God called them not to compete. God has not called you to compete. God has not called you to compare. Quit comparing yourself with other people. Quit looking over the fence, looking at your neighbor's grass grow while you're leaning on your hole. Don't lean on your hole watching your neighbor's crops grow. You know, in the Kentucky Derby, horses have what's called blinders. And they put blinders on those horses because there are horses right next to them. And they don't want the horses next to them to influence how they run. And be careful. Let God put some Holy Ghost blinders on you so you won't be looking to the left and right. Because, uh, if, you know what, if that, that's always, if, if you compare yourself with other people, let me tell you what happens. It will either produce pride or envy. Because there's always somebody that you may be, quote unquote, doing better than. And if you compare yourself with them, maybe they are moral midgets. If you compare yourself with a moral midget, you'll get a false sense of pride and superiority because of who you're comparing yourself with. But then there's always somebody who's doing better than us, making more money than us, has more visibility than us. If we compare with ourselves with them, then we can become resentful. So you don't compare yourself with anybody because that's not what you were created. You were not created to compete. You were not created to compare. You were not created to conform. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and let us not be conformed to this world. Um, one translation has that, let us not be conformed. Do not let the world shape you in its mold. I remember in a sermon that was preached by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, you know, we got 10 commandments, but there's also in our society an 11th commandment. And that 11th commandment is thou shalt not be different. Listen, you are not created by God to conform to anyone else's standard. That's not why you were created. You perhaps heard me tell the story of a son and his and his father and a donkey. And the son was on the donkey and the father was walking and a crowd looked at them and said, my God, that son doesn't have any respect for elders because if he had respect for elders, he would have the son, the father on the donkey and the son would be walking. He's young. He's got young legs. So they heard that. And guess what? They put the, the, the father on the donkey and the son was walking beside the donkey. And then as they came to another village, they were criticized and they said, this is horrible. You've got the father on the donkey and he's making the son. He's making the son walk beside him. What kind of father is that? And guess what? They changed because of what people were saying, conforming to what people thought. By the time they got to the end of the journey, because of so much criticism, both the father and son was carrying the donkey on their backs. And you carry a whole lot of donkeys on your backs when you live a life in which you are conforming to what other people think. One of the most liberating days in your life is the day when you come to realize that people do not have to like you to, to be happy. I think an amen goes there. People do not have to like you to be happy, for you to be happy. Amen? If God loves you, and if you love you, if people don't, they are the ones that have the problem, 
not you. Do not allow them to impose their issues, their problems, their idiosyncrasies on you. So you are not competed to compete, uh, created to compete. You are not created to compare. You are not created to conform. And you are not created to compromise. When you have a conviction, be a person of conviction and not a person of convenience. God cannot use people who are people of convenience. God uses people who are people of, of conviction. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like Daniel. Like Paul. Like Martin Luther King. People of conviction. Amen. So if God did not create us to compete, to compare, to conform, to compromise, why did God create us? God created us to make a contribution. That's right. You were created to make a contribution. You know, they say in the country, if you're going to take some wood off the wood pile, make sure that you every now and then add some wood on the wood pile. And there's always people who will always give me people and they want to take wood from the wood pile, but they never help to replenish the wood pile. As Christians and as mature Christians, we are called upon to make a contribution, to make a difference in society. And listen, you can never make a difference if you're not being who you are. And being who you are, because only you can be you, may mean that you have to be different than others. You have to be different sometimes to be different, to make a difference. You have to be different. That's right. And sometimes people will kick you out because you're different. But guess what they probably have done? They didn't kick you out. They probably kicked you forward. And don't worry, they'll catch up sooner or later. So only you can be you. Which begs the question, how do I determine the me I'm supposed to be? Well, I want to suggest a, um, an, an acronym for you based on the word form. Now you think about this. Your form determines your function. Example, if I'm formed with wings, how am I supposed to function? I'm supposed to function probably as a bird. If I'm formed with, with fins, I'm probably supposed to function as a fish. If I got a hammer at the top of a wooden stick, I'm probably supposed to function in a way that drives nails because I'm a hammer because my form determines my function. And each of us, my brothers and sisters, were formed differently. There's no one, and I want you to think about this. This can blow your mind when you really think about it. There is no one who has ever lived on this planet or is living on the planet today. Almost 8 billion people living on the planet today. And no one is like you. No one walks like you. Do you know you have a, a walk print that no one walks like you? I have a I don't know if you know Kevin James. He's, he's been with me for such a long time. Such a gifted brother. But I can always tell when Kevin James is coming into a room because no one walks like Kevin Brian James. And he probably will say, well, no one walks like Kevin Wayne Cosby. And that's true. That's true. You have a unique voice print. Did you know that your voice is different than anyone else's voice? The way your neurons in your brain are wired up is different. Your hair texture is different. Your fingernails are different. Your fingerprints are different. You are an original. Amen. Uh, there was a minister um, uh, that um, someone said to him, you know what? Uh, you know what? I think you're going to be the next Kevin Cosby. And that minister, who was a young minister, said, no, I'm going to be the next me. Because he can't be 
the next Kevin Cosby because there's no there's no other Kevin Cosby and I can't be him. And and you've got to get to the point where you accept this is who I am and form determines function. Now, what do you mean by form? Well, it is an acronym. It's an uh, excuse me. It's an uh, it's an acronym. And this is what form means. F means. Find out your interest and passions. What is it that interests you? For example, my wife, Bernetta, my wife, Bernetta, when I come into the house, she always has on HGTV, HGTV she has on f these fix-it shows, which bore me. Please don't tell her I said it, but they bore me, but I'm, that's, what, that's who she is, that's what she likes, because she's the domestic type of person. She has a servant's heart. She has the gift of helps. She will go out of her way to help people. Now, I will probably, while she's watching those television programs, I'll probably be watching something about history because that's my passion, that's my interest. What determines who you are is your passion, your pathos, ethos, Pathos, logos, logos, intellect, ethos, integrity, uh, pathos, passion, drive. In fact, uh, you can't be effective in anything if you don't have passion for it. If you're a teacher or a preacher or a community activist or a carpenter or if you are a business person, amen, that's your passion. And one of the clues uh, to determining what you're supposed to do with your life is find out what your interest and passion are. Or as um, one person said, uh, what makes your blood boil? What makes your blood boil? Passion. Oh, here's something else. Observe what others say you're good at. Now you may have an interest in something, but if no one ever says, my God, you're good at that, then that's probably not what you were formed to do. Now, I have to be careful here. There's a possibility you may be good at it, but you have not disciplined yourself and you have not stirred up the gift that God has given you and you've not um, maximized that gift through hard work and through the de development of the talent. But you know what? If you have that gift, you probably are going to have the passion to want to do it. But if no one ever says, well, you know what? You're a good cook, then that's okay. You're probably not a good cook. That's maybe not your calling. I, I've been pastor of St. Stephen Church 45 years, and I'm thankful to God. It's been a, a joyous journey. But in my 45 years, I've had the opportunity to teach, and people have told me, Pastor, yet that message blessed me. I prayed for people. I prayed for people, and people have gotten healed. I prayed for couples, and there's been reconciliation. So I prayed for people, and people thank me for, for the ministry of prayer. People thank me for sermons I've preached and the explanation and application of the Word of God. But in my 45 years, no one has ever requested that I sing a solo. Not one time. I've never been invited to uh, sing uh, Endless Love at a wedding. I've never been invited to sing God Will Take Care of You at a Funeral. And I like to sing. But you know what? It's not in the gift mix. It's not in the gift mix because no one else is affirming it. Here's R in the word form. R, reflect on past experiences. When I was five years old, <clears throat> I joined church and I was conscious of what I was doing. And I was baptized. And when I came up before the congregation at St. Stephen Baptist Church, um, in the ch which is now the chapel of our church, 
I told the pastor who was my grandfather, Dr. B.J. Miller Sr., that I'm going to be a preacher one day at five years old. And he believed it. And he asked one of the trustees of our church, a, a godly man by the name of Thomas Birch. He was married to a saintly woman, Anna Laura Birch. Anna Laura, God bless her. But Thomas Birch built me a makeshift pulpit when I was about five or six years old because my grandfather said I was going to preach. And you know what? He believed in me. I got away from it. In fact, I got ashamed for people when I was in middle school, it was junior high school then, telling me I was going to preach. But you know what? I couldn't seem to escape it. There were ministers who were coming to my life who were mentoring me. And that thing I could not get away from is the thing that was a, a, a sign to me that that is what I was formed to do. Reflect on what you can't get away from. And then M, how can you best make a difference in the world? Because the goal of the gifts and the talents that God gives us is that God gives us these gifts in order that we might be a blessing to other people. Let me read a scripture to you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 reads, For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus to do good works. Look at that. We were created, in other words, workmanship. That means God was forming you with gifts and talents and abilities and acumen. God was forming you and God said, you know what? I'm giving you these gifts. You're my workmanship in order that you might do good works, which God prepared in advance for us, amen, to do. Amen. You know what? To really live a great life, it is critical that you know what your purpose is. I've been called a pastor. I've been called to preach. I've been called to be a leader in our community. I've been called to be an advocate for the poor. That's my passion. I've been called to be a champion uh, for black Americans who are the victims of racism and social injustice. And that's my passion. And everybody to be truly effective in life, you have to know your purpose. In fact, I would submit to you that everyone has several basic needs. Everyone has needs. Just like fish need water, there are some needs that God created for us to have. First need that we have is the need for love. Love. We need to be loved. And by love, I'm talking about people around us who accept us unconditionally and who act in our best interest. That is what love is. Love is never selfish. It's always acting in the best interest of another person. That is what's called agape love. Agape, alpha, gamma, gamma, alpha, pe, epsilon. Agape love. Amen. Not eros, which is how can you please me? How can you satisfy me? But agape love. Here's something else. You have a need to be esteemed. You had a, a need to be valued. Quit hanging around people who diminish you. Go around people who celebrate you and don't tolerate you because you have a need to be affirmed, to be applauded, to be appreciated. Alfred Adler, one of the founders of psychoanalysis, a student of Sigmund Freud, said that the number one most dominant instinct and impulse in human personality is the need to be valued, to be esteemed. That's a basic need. Another need you have, all of us have, is the need for belonging. We are gregarious. That's a good word. Gregarious. We have a herd mentality, a herd instinct. Yeah, we need 
fellowship. Someone said fellowship is two fellows in the same ship. You need somebody in the ship with you because we are social people. We need to be accepted. We need to be included. We need to be supported. But another need we have is the need, amen, for purpose. A feeling that my life has meaning, a feeling that my life, amen, has direction. And if you ask God, and if you go through that form uh, piece that I gave you, and if you ask God, God will give it to you. Don't be like the person who died, went to heaven, and the angel took them uh, up to heaven where there were warehouses and he showed them all the warehouses and then he looked and there on in a box on a shelf had, there was a box that had his name on it and he asked the angel well what is that box with my name on it and he said well those are blessings that God intended for you to have that you didn't have enough faith to ask for I don't know about you but whatever God has for me I want it I don't want a box with intended blessings that I never got. All right. Now, as a new Christian and um, some of you are veterans in the faith. So this is new material for you. Let me go over what is our goals and as a church and part of your purpose as a new Christian is to use the gift that God has given you to help us advance those goals. There are five basic goals. I'm going to give you a goal each week. But the first goal is this, and that is we exist, you exist, part of your purpose, part of your mission is to exalt God's greatness. That's called worship. To exalt God's greatness. Uh, the word worship comes from an uh, an old Anglo-Saxon word, worth sight. And the key to the word is worth or value. So whenever we say worship, or when we worship the Lord, we are saying in effect that God is worthy. God is worthy. So let's break that word worship down. W, God's worthiness. O, obedience. R, God is just deserving of respect and reverence. S in worship is God is worthy of service. Uh, H, God is holy, uh, which means God is other, separated, distinct. Uh, not the man upstairs because God is not a man. There, God is so transcendent. You cannot call God the man upstairs. God is other. Our mind cannot fathom the greatness of God. You, you, just like you cannot pour the Atlantic Ocean in a teacup, nor can you measure the sky with a yardstick, nor can you put a shopping mall on the circularity of a lollipop. You cannot comprehend the holiness, the otherness, the greatness, the awesomeness of our great God who made galaxies upon galaxies until there are mega galaxies. That's how space is so, is so massive that when you look at the stars, you're looking at the light of stars that have died out millennials ago. But that's how expansive space is. God's holiness. I worship is inspiration. Through worship, we get inspired. Someone said that worship is simply me returning the breath God gave me back to God. Amen. I'm returning my breath because he gave me breath and everything that hath breath ought to praise the Lord. And then worship is also praise, praise, celebrating God. We are not the center of worship. God is the center of worship. Now, I'm dating myself, but back in the day, there was a television program called Johnny Carson. And Johnny Carson was always introduced by a man named Ed McMahon, who would introduce the guests, introduce the orchestra. And then behind a curtain, he would say, and here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. No one saw Ed McMahon because the focus is not on Ed McMahon. It was on Johnny Carson. And when it comes to worship, no one's supposed to see the preacher. 
No one's supposed to see the singers. No one's supposed to see the worshipers. Don't exalt the preacher. Don't exalt the pew. Preach the gospel fully and free. For if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I ain't going to sing because I don't have the gift. I'll draw all men unto me. So it's praise. That's what worship is. Amen. Now, worship is important. The primary purpose of worship is bringing glory to God. But there are secondary benefits from worship. And the secondary benefits from worship is that worship blesses the worshiper. It is critically important that we prioritize worship. And I say that especially in our day where streaming has become for many, okay, I'm going from teaching to meddling, that streaming worship has become a substitute for in-person worship. Now, sometimes we do have to stream. Sometimes we're not feeling well. Sometimes we're out of town. I get it. But you should never think that streaming worship and, and um, actually being in the assembly is the same thing because streaming worship is one directional. Think about that. It is one directional worship. If I'm preaching and you're streaming, you get to see me. So it's one directional. But I don't get to see you. And you have to create an atmosphere of worship by your presence, by your affirmation, by your amen. Let the church say amen. I can't hear your amen if you're streaming. The choir can't hear your amen if you're streaming. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I can't hear you say so if you're at home. God has been too good to you if you, have, if you can to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. In fact, <clears throat> The writer of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 says, and let us consider how we may spare one another on towards towards love and good deeds. Spur that word spur means to motivate. Let us consider. Let us think about how we can motivate each other towards love and good deeds. How can you motivate someone if they never see you because you're streaming. He says uh, in that scripture, he says, let us consider how we may spare one another towards love and good deeds to understand what this verse is saying. Consider some of the key words. Consider, let us consider means to observe. Let's observe each other. Only when you're fully present can you truly observe the needs of others and the needs of the church. The second word is one another, one another, not just one. You're, 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 you're streaming, it's one. In worship, it's one another, all right? And that term is often repeated in the New Testament, the word, the phrase, one another. You find that phrase so many times, for example, love one another. Uh, here's another way it's used. It says, now, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. So we're told to love one another. Let me give you another way that it's used. Uh, new Living Translation says, love each other in the same way I have loved you. This command, love each other. And you have to be here. Amen. Amen. It says, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Amen. If you love your if you love your neighbor as you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. Here's another one of those one another verses. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other. For God himself has taught you to love one another. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. First Peter 1 22. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply and with all your heart. First John chapter three, verse 11. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. 
1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who, who loves is a child of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we should surely love, ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. In 1 John 1 and 5, New Living Translation. I'm writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. There's that one another phrase again. This is not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. And then it's, we are told to love one another. We're told to serve one another. Can you serve one another if you're not present to serve one another? You have all these one another verses. Love one another. Serve one another. Forgive one another. All these one another verses which suggest that we are supposed to brothers and sisters gather. You know what? If I have one pencil, I can break it. But if I took one pencil and put it in a stack of pencils and try to break it, I couldn't break it. Because that one pencil is surrounded with other pencils in fellowship. If I take a coal that is with other coals on the barbecue pit and it is with those other coals, congregating with those other coals, the coals will stay warm. But if I take that one coal and isolate it from the other coals, it cools down. It cools down. And brothers and sisters, you will cool down if you forsake the assembling of yourself together. You know, it's interesting that when it says in Romans chapter 10 verse 25 and forsake not the assembling of yourself together as is the habit of some it corresponds directly with Luke chapter 4 verse 16 which says this about Jesus listen it says and Jesus went to the synagogue which is the Greek word for assembly assembly and synagogue are the same word synagogue assembly and Jesus went to the synagogue listen to it as it was his custom, his habit. And that's the same thing that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 says. It has the same words. It has the word assembly. It has the word habit. The difference is, is that some were not following Jesus because Jesus made it a habit of attending worship. Not only because he benefited, but also because his presence helped Worship, it, it helped the preacher, it helped the choir, it made a statement. Do you know when you get up, when you get dressed, when you make worship a priority and inconvenience yourself, you are making a profound statement to the world that Jesus, because wor worship is the word worth, is worth getting up, worth getting dressed, worth, if you're near, getting your hair fixed. Why are you getting your hair fixed? Because Jesus is worthy. Why are you getting up? Because he's worthy. Why are you using gas to get to church? Because he's worthy. He's been good to me. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. He's made a way out of no way. He's given me strength. And then, guess what? If you come to worship and really get your praise on, hear the word, participate in worship, it gives you strength to get through the week. And we do need strength to get through the week. Amen. I forgot what's the name of that animal that uh, is able to run uh, a cheetah. A cheetah. The fastest animal on earth is the cheetah. The cheetah can run 72 miles. That's fast. 72 miles. I know somebody who can, who can drive faster than that. That's my wife, Barnetta. Oh, God, let me, Lord, please help Barnetta slow down. Amen. Barnetta can go faster than that. She can go, especially when she's getting me from campus to campus. But that cheetah can go 72 miles an hour. But guess what? He can go fast, but he can't go long. 
because his heart does not allow him to sustain that speed. And coming to worship helps you to sustain your strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jesus is worthy of worship. In fact, that's the master theme of the book of Revelation. There's praise because the lamb in the book of Revelation comes out, takes the book from the hand of God, and there's pandemonium, there's worship, and they bow down and they say, worthy is the lamb. And Jesus is the lamb, my brothers and sisters, that is worthy of worship. I hope you will come, not only because God is worthy, not only because you get blessed, but I hope you will come to worship because worship in worship, you help to bless and minister to other people. Well, brothers and sisters, I've gone a long time. But so I'm going to close this lesson. And I hope that you've been blessed by this lesson. And I hope, listen to me, if you don't have a church home, uh, and if you're not saved, God wants you to be saved. Now, to be saved simply means that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Amen. And here's also some bad news. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. All have sinned. The wages of sin is death. But Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says that God has committed his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Romans 10 and 9 says, For whosoever shall call us, well, no, it says, For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10 and 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be. And the word saved simply means to be delivered. God, all of us need to be delivered from sins in our past, sins in our present, and sins in our future. And God delivers us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if you've made that decision to follow Christ, get on the journey. Ask Christ into your life. Talk to Christ. Christ is listening. Amen. If, if you can't find God, it's because God's not lost. You are. You open yourself up to God like a flower opens itself up to the sun and watch your life bloom. Call us here, reach us here at St. Stephen Church. Contact us here, New Start at sscLive.org. Let me say that again, New Start at sscLive.org. Or call us, we'll get back with you here at St. Stephen Baptist Church here in Louisville, Kentucky, 502-583. Uh, six seven nine eight extension zero i hope you've been blessed by this lesson <clears throat> this is just the first lesson in a series of lessons the first one is on we exist to exalt god's greatness that's called worship we not only exist to exalt god's greatness we also exist to evangelize god's world that's called witness and then we exist also to equip god's people that's getting people in the word we also exist to express god's love and we exist also to expand God's kingdom. And that has to do with justice. I hope you'll get these lessons. I hope you'll be blessed. Thank you so very much for joining us. And until um, Reverend Geneva comes back, she's just outstanding. Well done, Nelson. Until Miss Well Done Nelson comes back, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Peace.